today. Yeah, the power of God's word in my favor. My power went out at 10 p.m. last night. A tree landed on my power, and I'm still without power. So I'm hoping to, I'm hoping tonight I have power. And it's 100 degrees here too. So, oh, geez. yeah, we got we got Letty, and we got YouTube. Jim, there's some Final Destination shit going on with your life in the last year, I think. <laughs> yeah. Stay inside. <laughs> All right. In in the frozen tundra, it's 100? That's what people forget is that it, Doug probably experiences the same. We have cold winters, but the, the, the summers can be brutal, too, and humid, too. It's not a dry heat. It's a humid heat. Yeah, spring yeah. and fall last about two days a piece here. And yeah. it goes from minus 35 yeah. to Yeah, we're on we're in our second week of like of high 90 degree temperatures with, with high humidity. So and now I have no power. So and you got a jacket on. Well, I got I gotta look good. It, I might be sweaty, <laughs> but I gotta look good. Where's your tie? That honestly, I'll be honest, usually I do wear a tie. That was my one thing today, is like I'm rushing. I literally like had to move to my wife's office because I had no power at my house. And I grabbed a suit jacket and I said, hell with it. This, the, the dress shirt, the tie are not coming out today. I'm going to go casual. So, <laughs> so no, no, so no tie or, 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 or um, dress shirt today. All right. I think is everybody good to go. Good morning, yeah. everybody. Hello. All right. G to G. Okay. Let's rock it out. All right, everyone, welcome back to TM 101. As you can see today, we are somewhat short on the TM side. Um, our colleagues are all spread around the country doing their thing. So we're, uh, it's just the three of us today, but we are still gonna get the same quality content you always do. Um, so welcome back. This is our episode, I don't even know what episode number we're on. Episode 78? 77, like 77. Let's call it late Close 70s. to 80. Let's call it cool to 80. <laughs> Between 75 and 80. Um, <laughs> and this is the last episode of our spring semester. Um, and before we get started, you know, uh, please remember if you're on the Zoom to change your chat settings to all panelists and attendees. And if you're watching along on YouTube, welcome. We will also be monitoring the chat there as well if you have any questions for our panelists today. So um, without further ado, let's get into it. This one is gonna be a good one. I think I'm gonna learn the most out of any of our webinars today. This rigging is the dark arts to me, so I'm really <laughs> excited for this one. So, um, okay, today's concerts have become dazzling spectacles that seek to perform outperform one another. The sheer size and scope of these shows Show-stopping large-scale productions would not be possible without rigging. Rigging is the hardware used to lift, lower, and suspend the equipment, whether it be lighting, audio, or video, or otherwise, um, above the stage, and often the whole arena. Um, and riggers are the people responsible for installing it safely. To say that the lives of touring personnel and audiences are in, in the hands of riggers is absolutely not an understatement. We have the utmost respect for the work that riggers do, and today we have three of the absolute best in the business here with us to talk about what they do. So I'm going to pass over to Adrian to get us started. Thank you, guys. Am um, I coming in loud and clear? Check, check. Everybody good? Can you hear me? I'm having a wonky good. tech day today. Um, we're super happy to welcome Terry Campbell, Letty Alcala, and Gabe Wood to the program today. Really, really um, such a wealth of experience and uh, technical prowess and also really important folks in terms of how they lead in this world. Um, and we're excited to hear from them. So let's go, Miss Terry, tell us, um, you will go deeper into the hows and what's, but you know, your name, where, where you currently were, and again, talking post-pandemic, because we're all just coming back and things are changing. How long have you been doing this? And kind of a little, you know, a little bit about what you guys have done. So we'll go to Terry first. Good morning, Miss Terry Campbell. Hello. So I'm Teresa Campbell from San Jose, California, but they call me Terrible Terry. Road guys never forget my name if I say that. 
Um, and I'm almost 66 years old. I've been rigging for 42 years. Um, I actually, my college uh, background, I was an animal health technician, uh, like veterinary uh, RN, as it were. Um, I got a job at Stanford University working with the uh, Coco and Michael, the talking gorillas, the narcoleptic dog colony. I was the first technician in the whole world to uh, deal with narcoleptic dogs um, and the uh, NASA space chimps and just so many animals. Um, and I had been sent to a, a small venue. Space monkeys, space monkeys. Space monkeys. Exclamation point. Space well, monkeys, everybody. Okay, space monkey. Um, <laughs> I just had to say that to make sure everybody understood Terry worked with space monkeys. Space monkeys. In fact, a, yeah, in fact, I was about to get sent point. to Cape Canaveral with Cape Kennedy with uh, one of the space monkeys, but uh, I did something different. So um, I had been sent to be a backdoor security girl at one of our local theaters through the Stanford Karate Club that I was working out with. And uh, one of my first gigs, all these motley guys came walking in the back door in black clothes and uh, starting hitting on me mostly, but I didn't understand what a stagehand was or what a rigger was uh, until I met my, my husband, Howard, who has hand trained me these 42 years. He says, I still don't know anything. Um, but on our third or fourth date, he took me into the ceiling of the cow palace at like 105 feet. It's just a big, horrible, dirty, giant, Quonset hut in the South Bay area. Um, and those were in the days when there was no harnesses or safety lines or anything like that. And luckily I had been a runner, so I was in pretty good shape, but it just kind of started there. Uh, Carrie, just... I'm going to stop you for one sec because I'm going to come back and we're going to go further into the how we got there. I want to do a quick intro. Gotcha. Letty, Letty, introduce yourself. Tell us, give us the, the, the Reader's Digest version of just who you are, where you are now, what you've done in the past, just to tell us who you are. We're going to come back to everybody's trajectory in a second. Go, Letty. Okay, I'm Letty. Uh, Leticia Alcala is my proper name. <clears throat> Been in the concert entertainment business for 35 years. And that time has flown. I'm a member of IOTSE Local 50 in Sacramento and uh, IOTSE Local 107 in Oakland, California. I've toured with uh, several artists uh, like Van Halen, Madonna, the Eagles, Michael Jackson, Tina Turner, Cher, and others. Um, I'm currently the house lead rigger at the Oakland Arena. And I'm still rigging other venues when I'm available, like the Greek Theater and, you know, the Fox or whatever it is they send me to when I'm available. So that's it in a nutshell right now. Awesome, Letty, thank you. A note, two amazing women heading up huge venues, rigging for decades. Ladies did not just come into the technical world of concert touring in the last five years. I just wanna make that point before we move on to Gabe Wood, come on with it. See Howard, something just went wrong with the computer. You're my name is Gabe Wood, and okay. I definitely have I not guess. ever worked with space monkeys. <laughs> um, I'm a I'm a touring rigger, so a head rigger for uh, concert tours, and I've been doing that for the past 20 years. And uh, like you said, Adrian, both Letty and Terry are fantastic, and they do a great job. Awesome, yeah. awesome. Thanks, Gabe. All right, so Miss Terry, talk to us about that that date that you went on with Mr. Howard, who brought you up into the second <laughs> venue. Is she froze? Are we good? No, no, she's here. Are we good? Terry, you're good. Oh, we're missing good. her vote audio. Yes, yeah, she's here. Yep, you're good. You can unmute down there on the uh, lower left. Let me see. Can I do it for you? See a little the microphone button down there on the lower left. If you click it, you could unmute. All right, let's go to Letty and we'll come back to Terry when she unmutes in a sec. Go on, girl. Thanks, Terry. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what up? <laughs> What'd you just ask? So um, tell us tell us how you got where you know how you got started, how you ended up rigging. Yeah, well, I was a stagehand for Bill Grant Presents for uh, the first uh, couple years. And the second year, we were doing a lot of uh, outdoor stages uh, and uh, doing a lot of climbing. 
And I wanted to get into uh, uh, Local 107 because it was like the Bay Area rock and roll local at the time. But that door was sealed shut. And so once I heard that uh, the Sacramento Kings were, or the Kings were moving to Sacramento, uh, they, they opened up the small Arco, little Arco with like a 50 foot grid. It was just a, a small building while the big building was getting uh, built. And so that's where I started uh, rigging and, you know, just getting to, to see what it was about and just working around, uh, you know, stayed rigging guys that, that were in the area, just absorbing as much information as I could from those really talented, skilled guys. And, uh, you know, I ran into, I, I'd run into uh, Brent Anderson and uh, he asked him if he would come help us out at the Arco on a show and, and he did. And I called the bridles and um, went up and pulled with them. And he asked me how come I wasn't touring. And uh, I just told him I wanted to rig. You know, I'd love to, but I want to be on the road rigging, not really doing lighting or set at the time. But I was getting a lot of uh, education and knowledge working with the local, getting my apprenticeships, uh, just to, even in the theater, there is a, a lot of knowledge in there and I respect it, but my heart was in rock and roll. So a few months later, he had came out of retirement and uh, was out with Van Halen. And I, I think he was actually at the shoreline when they, uh, when uh, somebody called to make sure I was going to be at the Cal Expo the next day, because uh, that's when he had asked me if I was interested in going out with him into an arena tour. And, and I, I went out as a third rigger. So um, that was a lot of fun. And I learned a lot and, uh, you know, came home and pick up some other tours and, just one thing led to another. Uh, my phone started ringing, um, did a, a Madonna tour and the Eagles, like I said, Michael Jackson. It's just like the work just kind of evolves uh, as uh, you get to be known. And, and I was always coming home and working local gigs because I always like to I always like to rig shows and be in different buildings. So that's pretty much uh, how it came to be. And, you know, in certain life circumstances there take you. Go out of the scene um you know it's right. like I, sorry we're so bad. Uh, yeah and I, I had a uh certain situations that would bring me home and i think uh there's decisions that people always have to make when they're out there and it's just a matter of how they deal with it and you know it's uh you can't really uh control your friend's mortality or or your parents' mortality, but you can help. And I think that was a turning point for me is just trying to decide what's what's the important thing out there. Even though I love my job, I'm gonna make the best of it, but I had to juggle a few things. So I'm, I'm really happy to be home right now and uh, close to home, you know, uh, working at the uh, Oakland Arena. Amazing. Yeah. I've been fortunate yeah. that doors, good doors were always opening up when I was in certain situations. Very cool. Terry, tell us about how Howard took you in the Raptors for that very sexy date y'all went on. It was indescribable. I mean, it was frightening and, and <laughs> exhilarating. I mean, any, any rigor will tell you, I mean, there is kind of like a, like an adrenaline boost that you get. I mean, it was just like nothing, even my own family really doesn't understand what I do or have done all these years. So um, I give Howard hundred percent credit. Um, but in terms of what it was like, uh, I remember that before he took me up in the rafters, um, when we had our first like sleepover, I'll call it, um, I looked at he came, he came to my house after a rigging load out from the cow and he was just so dirty. And I thought, he looked like a rodeo cowboy. I thought, what does somebody do for a living to get this dirty? Um, and then it wasn't until I went up in the ceiling of the cow and then came down and kind of went in the bathroom and kind of hawked up a big black cloud that, you know, and these are a long time ago. It's a little bit, the building I work in now is much cleaner, but. Um, oh, the glamour. Oh, the glamour. It was, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. So, but my lungs are clear. I'm healthy. Awesome. So how did you really, you know, 
you went on a date with Howard. He took you in the rafters to test your gumption. And now you've been the head rigger at a major venue in North America for decades. How'd you get from there to that? Well, I realized pretty quickly that the only way he and I were going to be together was if I learned his profession uh, because he was touring like, you know, 10 months of the year. So um, I was still working at Stanford, uh, but I kind of, like I said, I kind of eased out of that. And he ended up taking me on as his assistant on um, Aerosmith, Deep Purple, Jethro Tull, and a couple of big Broadway uh, National One tours. Uh, so I kind of, you know, got, got my, my rigging chops going around the country. And at the time, this would have been like the um, early 80s. I only met two other females, like in the whole country. Um, and I don't, and I don't remember if they were riggers or I don't think they were riggers, but maybe one of them. Um, so yeah, it's not like I was the best or anything. I just had the good luck to be one of the first for no real, you don't need a penis to do it. I don't know why. Get on, so Terry. Get on, Terry. I, I'm just saying. <laughs> so anyway, so then we came back home after all this touring and happily, they built an arena a half a mile from our home here in San Jose. Uh, so rather than making that hour each way trip, um, you know, now I'm, you know, like a five or 10 minute walk, even though we drive because we have a bunch of tools. So for 25 years uh, since the arena opened, I've been the, um, the head rigger at the SAP. And then my husband, Howard, is our union steward. So we're kind of like Ms. Mr. and Mrs. Arena. That's real. It's really that's really a really legendary and epic story. And yeah. and for the the new folks that don't know, uh, the Campbells are highly lauded as rigging royalty out there in the world. And and it's it's a pretty sweet story. Um, Mr. Gabe Wood, this is a really this is Gabe. I got to tell you, from rigging to rigging, really cool how how Gabe Wood got into the biz. Your first rigging experiences were, yeah. So. So I, uh, I lived in Baltimore 20 years ago and I, I worked on a traditional gaff topsail schooner um, and I lived on the schooner and the mast there was 130 feet high. And so we'd climb every day to repair the rigging on that. And a friend of mine that was just lived in Baltimore told me I needed to come out and, and do this concert stuff. So I, I came out as a steel climber for the Metallica build I just think it's so brilliant that you were literally doing the original rigging that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years before you yeah. became a rigger, a show rigger. Yeah, That's yeah, brilliant. Totally. So brilliant. Yeah. And so, um, so essentially I, I uh, came out as a steel climber for the Metallica tour when Metallica came through Baltimore and the local hands were, were really short and they were really short handed. So I ended up working um, two back-to-back 35-hour -back shifts with five hours off in the middle and I climbed the entire time and and the stagecoach guys were were only working 24s at that time and and the head stagecoach at the end of it the head stagecoach guy remembered me and said hey give me your contact info and I might have a job for you next year um, and so I did and I stayed in touch with him and the next year he he hired me as a stagecoach guy to build steel for in sync and that was InSync's Pop Odyssey tour when they were 96 trucks um, total. Um, and so on that tour, I built the PA wings and the PA wings had, had rigging beams that sat up on top of them where the riggers would hang all the points from. And I didn't know any better. So when I built the PA wings, I, I put the rigging beams exactly where they were in the drawing and, and didn't know that the other two guys that were building the other two stages just slapped the rigging beams up up on top of the structure and just said, well, the riggers will move them into place wherever they want them. So at the end of that, at the end of that tour, the head rigger came up to me and said, you did a really great job. Do you want to come work for me on Brit Britney Spears and learn how to do concert rigging? And I said, yeah, sure. Well, what's that? And, and that was my first tour as a rigger. That was in 2001. So. That's so I, really, that's really yeah. such a, I, I'm, I gotta say, I'm just constantly blown away by guests whose first tours were Britney Spears and Aerosmith. And <laughs> yeah, Arts. mine was mine was an unknown local band doing small clubs. It just blows me away that you you know consistently all of our guests who who have started big 
and started at the top and been able to hang on. I'm just, I'm, I'm consistently impressed by that. I just wanted to add that, you know, it's, that's, yeah, that's yeah. real pressure. That's real pressure. Yeah, I went from, uh, yeah, it was Brittany at 22 trucks to InSync's celebrity tour, which was their last tour together. And then from InSync to uh, Justin, Justin's first solo tour. Um, and that was Justin, Christina. And then my first tour as a head rigger was when Christina split off and kind of did her own thing for a while. So, really yeah. cool. Super yeah, was, cool. All right, yeah. let's toss it over to Jim and Terry. Um, Jim and Terry are gonna knock out an awesome lightning round of terms. Go for you guys. So Terry, be before we talk about your day looks like on the job as a rigger, let's do a lightning round, some rigging terms, since our students will be hearing a lot of these words in your description <laughs> of your job. First off, let's start with what's a down rigger? A down rigger would be um, an individual that is pretty much dedicated to doing all the work that happens on the ground. And that includes um, helping to get the motors into their proper uh, locations, uh, putting uh, these wire rope slings that we build together with these uh, attachment shackles, uh, getting all that built, uh, helping to uh, use a motor uh, control pendant to run the chain motors up. Uh, we use these chain crawling motors that you'll hear this term a lot. Um, I guess you probably, but lightning around means that's what yeah. it is. That's what we'll the ground rigger does. <laughs> um, uh, what, what's a uprigger? So that would be the person that is up into the grid, um, often like 100 feet away, and they will have on a harness and a personal hand line, we call it, like a rope of appropriate length and type. Uh, and they will be the ones up on the beams waiting to receive the equipment that the ground guys will be tying onto their ropes. What is chalk? And chalk, I looked around our garage, I don't know if I can find any, but we use these big chunks of railroad chalk um, that we mark our um, all the locations of these chain crawly motors go on the ground. Um, I've got a few props here. So nice. And so that's what so chalk is, yeah. That's that's what that's what we mark locations of gear. Great. What is marking the floor or mark out? That will be when the road rigger comes in uh, and they've got their plot that I'm sure they always have memorized. And uh, they grid out the arena floor with 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 hundred foot tape measures, and um, mark the locations for each of these chain crawling motors. And we have we predominantly use these motors can pick up one ton of equipment each, two tons. We've got half tons, uh, and that's mostly what we use. Great. Uh, what are points? So each. Let's say Britney Spears comes in with her show and she needs to have 150 of these chain crawling motors suspended from our grid by these upriggers. Uh, and that picks up her show, that picks up the, the lighting trusses, the sound speakers, video walls, any other kind of things that move around. And so um, each point is one of these locations where one of these chain crawling motors will go. So she would have 150 points, which means she'd have 150 of these suspended motors that are going to pick up her entire show. Yeah, I think we've gone through motors. Let's see, what is it? What is a bridle? So a bridle is um, what the ground person is going to be building out of these pieces of, uh, of wire rope. And we've got them in different, uh, my husband's so old, they used to go around with a spool of wire rope and cut them and like use them, you know, thimbles and stuff like to attach them. And nowadays we have um, a fixed lengths that we use. So a bridle would be what like two guys sitting across from each other on beams would receive to pull up and attach to the two beams to suspend one of these chain crawling motors between those two beams. What is a dead hang? So dead hang is if you're lucky enough for one of these chain crawling motors to be directly under one of our you know, grid beams, then it just takes one rigger and his, his or her rope to pull up this piece of steel, wrap it around the beam, and then dangling from the steel is gonna be this chain crawling motor. What is a saddle? Um, a saddle would just probably refer to the 
the slinging of the beam, the wire rope that goes around the beam that is like, here's the beam and then here's the wire rope. And then from that is dangling wire. So that would be, that's a term I don't use a lot in my arena, but yeah. What is a basket? For me, a basket would be kind of like a saddle, which is kind of the same thing. It's just the, um, in fact, my husband is so old that they used to put, they used to affix these, uh, these baskets to the beams using like three shackles. It was all very complicated. And he was on a Jethro Tull tour pre-rigging out of our pickup, didn't have enough shackles. And so he said, you don't really need three, you only need two. So it's just these pieces of wire rope steel with little thimbles and then these shackles. I should have brought one. I brought a, I brought a little shiv, but I didn't bring a shackle. All right, now something that I can barely pronounce, so I don't know how anybody understands what it is, the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, I hope I'm ready for you um, because I suck at math um, and I had to go back and learn math that I was horrible at it as a, I mean, I got C's, but you know, my mom and my family are all math gifted. So I don't know if you see my little picture. What I did, these are, this is 50 pennies. This is a roll of pennies. This is the Pythagorean theory, theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So you have like five times five is 25 pennies and four times four is 16 pennies. Three times three is nine pennies. That makes 50 pennies. And I've arranged them so that they make a little triangle, a little right triangle. And that's the Pythagorean theorem. We use this in our business because when we are... Um, hanging these, these wire rope things here, I'll show you real quick, really real quick, lightning round. <laughs> Sorry, stop me if I talk too much. Oh, this so, is great. Thanks, okay, man. lightning round. So let's say this is our arena beam, mine's 24 feet. We got a guy sitting here. We got a guy or a girl, a guy girl sitting here <laughs> and they're ropes. And here's the floor, 24 feet. You're out of the camera. Oh, sorry. And then somewhere the road rigger wants one of these motors. Here's our point. So I have to figure out how these two guys are going to pull up these two pieces of, of wire rope with the, with the thing dangling down so that it hits perfectly within like three inches. So I'm doing math or I'm doing the Pythagorean theory. I'm going A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And so I know this one because I know how tall my arena is. And I know this direction because I know where the rigor wants this thing to fall, but I have to figure this out. So it's, it's actually super, it's math that kids learn in like fifth grade, but we use it. And I'm, I'm stupid, dumber than a fifth grader. So that just goes to, yeah. Goes to that, yeah. Doug, there you I'm, go. Yeah, I told you it was the dark arts. Yeah, um, that's that's great. Thank you, thanks uh, Terry for running through that with us. We're, we're actually going to stay with you really quick, and then we'll go to Letty and Gabe bring them in on this. But let's, you, you know, you don't need to know deep knowledge of rigging to uh, in a tour management role. But let's let's walk through what your day to day looks like, starting with you, Terry. Um, and you know, walk us through what, what you're doing wh when you get in in the morning and then take us through it from there, if you will. Okay, so um, I wanna clarify something because Gabe and Letty, I've done very little road rigging and they do quite a bit. So they're gonna be more experienced in a lot of things than I'm really required to be. I kind of only know my own building, yeah. but um, my day, you know, money-wise, my day starts when I walk in the building, uh, when the road rigger, shows up, although I get there early and get my equipment. So I might get a phone call uh, a couple of days before from the road rigger, um, mm -hmm. just telling me about the show, how big it is, and if there's anything that, you know, might require some extra equipment, like some spanner beams or anything that we are going to need for our specific building. So we, we discuss that. And I know, you know, 90%, 99% of the road people. Um, and then since I'm sleeping with the steward, I get a look at the um, crew list which lets me see how many uh, riggers I'm going to get. And I kind of know, you know, most of them, all of them. So I kind of know like who's coming. 
And uh, so I'll spend some time looking at that and thinking about how many guys I'm going to need in the ceiling as opposed to the floor. And then I will also, um, if I'm lucky, I might get a show plot sent to me by the road rigger so I can look at it and have some more ideas about maybe some trouble spots in my building where we have this gargantuan scoreboard in the middle as many hockey arenas do. Um, so there'll be some stuff like that where I can start visualizing maybe traffic problems. Um, and then my day starts, I'll get to work maybe like 20 minutes early. I'll grab the, uh, the show, the local radios for my guys and myself. I've got my, um, my rigging kit with my um, laser level that I use for, for my, uh, my figuring. I've got my bag of chalk. Uh, I've got my, my handy my helmet. Um, and I've got a little cheat sheet that I've cooked up that kind of helps me quickly do this math so that I can know from where they fall on the floor what is required. Uh, and so then the road rigger will come in and if we're lucky, we'll have an hour head start to run out the, the tapes and mark his points on the floor. And then I'll start doing the math in that hour. And then an hour later, my crew will come in and I'll have to kind of simultaneously be, you know, be looking them over and checking up on them and still doing math. And uh, I've got a safety box that I bring in in the morning and I'll assign one of my riggers to go through it. And that's in case if someone were to fall in their harness in our grid, we're expected to rescue them. So um, we train for that. So that's another important thing. Uh, and then if we're lucky, the rest of the crew won't come in when my group comes in an hour later and we'll have a little peace and quiet to start laying our, our one ton motors, our two ton motors and getting everything set up, get our boxes arranged. If we're unlucky, the whole entire crew is coming in and there's trusses pushing and people getting in our way and we're getting in people's way. And then I have a lot more to worry about with safety because now I've got 150 people with 30, 40 guys over their head with loose gear. Amazing. Um, thank you, Terry. Letty, how does your day differ from Terry's, if at all? And take us through from there once, once, the, once the prep is done. Well, I have a 85-mile uh, drive, not a two-block walk from Terry. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, you know, traffic is really bad here in the Bay Area. It's kind of like the worst in the nation, probably. So I'm in the North Bay. I like to get up really early. I probably get up about three for an 8 a.m. call. And I'll do my drive and I'll arrive at Alameda, go to a coffee shop or go for a walk at the estuary down the waterfront just to relax. And then I'll, I'll get to the job site uh, at the arena about half hour before my call just to grab my radios and uh, just to have me a little bit of Zen time and then uh, stretch out and start marking centers. <clears throat> and by that time, the road crew usually comes in early. So, you know, we go over stuff and, and then we, uh, we chat, we chat about the steel they carry, uh, deck chains, two footers, their, their heights. And then they start marking out, laying, they, they lay their tapes and they start marking their show, mapping out their show, and I start following. And sometimes I have to ask questions, holler at them, ask them a question as far as their flexibility. But, uh, you know, that's how we just work it through and coast on down. And right, actually, I should backtrack right at the, when eight o'clock comes, I have to stop writing numbers and go have a, uh, give the guys a safety speech. That really breaks up the momentum of as far as what I, I'm doing, but I'm supposed to give a safety speech. And uh, so I'll kind of do another roll call and, you know, safety speech and then have them sign off on the speech and then explain to them what, what's, what's going to happen and the order that the road rigger wants it done. Sometimes I'll call the the tour rigger over and see if he wants to say anything to the guys prior. Sometimes we want like eight guys up right away to start on two tons. So I have to break off those guys right away and then hand out radios. And, and then it's just, you know, head down and keep Mark until it's, until it's done. Cause you got 
20 plus trucks getting dumped on top of you and you just got to like power through it, make sure everything's like done safely and, uh, you know, on a timely manner as well. So it's just working in, you know, you always, always trying to call back the tour rigger to see if this is, this will work or that'll work or, you know, whatnot, or they'll call me over and tell me this, they need this one next, et cetera. So I try to communicate with uh, key guys up in the ceiling with radios and um, until it gets up to trim, well, it, until it gets hung. And then, and then once it gets hung, then we break down some guys and uh, we go to a minimum crew, whether it's uh, four up and two down, if we have two tons, or sometimes more, if they have a lot of more two tons or follow resters to hang. Um, but so we, we do a, a cut back until the grid is uh, at trim. And once it's at trim, then we, we cut it all back. And, and uh, um, how many, typically, how many guys and girls will you have under your command on a typical show day? It depends. Um, you know, sometimes if it's a 20 person up call <clears throat> for 100 points, then it's a uh, 20 up, 10 down, plus myself. That's mm -hmm. what we'd like. And that's what works out schedule wise. <clears throat> sometimes it, it's more, it, it can be 24 and 12, but that's the ratio. And when it's not, um, it, when it's not, then it will it will stretch out a little bit longer than, than the four hours they want it to. So, you know, I try to communicate with the riggers about that. Most, most shows don't have a problem with it, but if they have a certain deadline or a timeline they'd like to meet, that's, those are the numbers I, I throw at them. So sometimes it's 30 guys, sometimes it can be 40 guys altogether. Okay. Before we, before we rock off to, to Gabe or um, for a second, I just, I have a, a screenshot share really quick. Go ahead. Can you see it? Do you see it? <laughs> yeah. Do you see that? Yeah. <laughs> that's that's my screen share. That's that's we'll the have that next. Yep. Yep. Looking up, trying <laughs> to get it happening. Okay, well, that was it. That was the visual aid of the day. Yeah, <laughs> some people notice uh you know, I've gone to my chiropractor quite a bit, um, <laughs> but it, I've, I've had x-rays. It's kind of funny when you look at uh, a rigger's x-rays, their vertebrae are rounded in the front side and then on their neck, it's, it's kind of rounded in the back. Wow. Uh, That's really this funny. Is looking That's up. <laughs> I want to pick up two points you said there and connect the dots and um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty certain I'm not. First of all, you said you get there nice and early so you can take a walk and just relax before the show. And secondly, you said that, you know, you alluded to getting your head down and working, but working safely. And I imagine you, you give yourself that buffer period between stopping your car and starting your day because you have to just be relaxed. Safety is obviously the primary concern with your job. So you want to just take a moment and reset yourself because coming out of your car, particularly out of traffic, is is not the most conducive to a clear mind. Is that? Am I right on the mark there? Yes, you're you're dead on. Like uh, I don't like getting caught in traffic. I'd rather drive early and and rest and chill out, go for a walk in the waterfront because the day is intense. It, it is really intense for you know uh, a, a lead rigger or both, you know, even the, the touring lead riggers, uh, it's on you because you know your building, they're relying on your numbers. <clears throat> You're trying to give them the best performance you can and doing it safely and giving them what the show needs is their trim height. You know, uh, we do have our challenge of getting trim heights there because uh, our, our building is, goes from, uh, it's like 64 up to 82. It's raked from the center out. <clears throat> it's not a typical building. It's got a 96 spokes into a compression ring at center. So it's kind of nice to just get there early and just kind of have your, your Zen time relax. It's like the calm before the storm and uh, get prepared. You know, I like to get in the radios and as much as I can early. And that's why I mark out centers uh, before the guys come in and try to get that little bit of head start. Amazing. Well, thank you, Letty. Um, Gabe. You're on the other side of it. You're on the tour side. So you're going to be coming in. Let's say you're coming into 
Terry's room or Letty's room, you know, walk us through how your day goes. And obviously you guys are going to be working very closely together on your show day, but tell us what the tour side of rigging looks like. Yeah, totally. Um, for, for us, ideally we're not walking in blind and, and walking in at the start of the show day without having talked to either Terry or Letty or, or any of our local head riggers. Um, ideally you want to be sharing your rig plot with them and, and discussing on the phone any potential problems or, or challenges on the day. And then also agreeing on the number of, of personnel on site to be able to get the job done in the time frame that the tour needs. Um, you know, different tours have different requirements as far as the speed of the rigging. Um, so hopefully we would discuss all that beforehand and talk through a lot of those details. So when we walk in on, on the morning, we both know what's going on on the day. Um, but we, we got the easy commute. We get off the bus right at the, right at the gig um, and stumble in there, you know, sometimes on an overnight or sometimes with a lot of rest. Um, and we'll start laying out our show. Um, we will ideally have, again, with, with a rigging overlay in AutoCAD, have placed the show in a very specific position. Um, and we will find that position in the room and start marking out the points with, let's say, Letty or Terry. Um, once we have all the circles down, especially on the big tours, things that are over 20 trucks now, a lot of times they won't give you the entire hour even if you want the entire hour to mark the floor, they'll want to start the truck dump to make sure that they get the trucks dumped in the four hours. So they'll be sending the rigging truck in, you know, somewhere right around that first hour or sometimes even a little bit earlier. And, and we'll lay out all the motors in place by all the points to make sure that the motors are organized with the correct motors in the correct locations. Um, you know, once that's done, we'll be sending riggers up in the air and start hanging the show. Uh, one of the main jobs of a, of a touring head rigger during, during the day and during the show install is to make sure that we hang things in the sequence that the tour needs. Because different tours, different tours build in a certain way, like different tours have to layer their trusses a certain way or have to have a specific thing up so another thing can go up underneath it. And so it's really important to be able for us to be able to communicate with our with our local heads and our teams to make sure that that the that the show gets hung in the sequence that it's necessary to hang the show. Otherwise, what happens is you'll start dropping time on your build, not just for the rigging department, but for the entire show. And then that has a knock on effect on on cost and so on and so forth. And then just just uh, things like sound checks in the afternoon if you're not making your build times. So uh, once, once the show is hung, you know, once the motors are hung, we'll get all the motors run up, start hanging trusses. Um, we'll be along with our, ideally our departments be being doing, we will be doing safety checks on the trusses to make sure, you know, little things like truss pins are in, our clips are in, um, shackles are turned in all the way um, and that the trusses are ready to fly. Um, um, after that, we'll start getting trusses to trim. Uh, trusses will go to trim. If if you're if you're if you're rolling along pretty well, you should be having your trusses trimming at about three three to four hours. So you can roll the stage at four to five hours. I don't know. If we've we've mentioned it um, several times, but I don't know if we gave a definition of getting things to trim. Could you just give us a quick um, definition on that, Dave? Yeah, so that's so once you once you hang the trusses or the speakers underneath the motors, the chain crawling motors as Terry described them, um, the the getting a truss to trim means getting it to the position it hangs in for the show, and and the show design will have I'm, very specific. I'm pretty sure. That. Sorry, Adrian. I'm pretty sure, Gabe, that the photo that I just shared was everybody in that moment bringing the rig to trim. Yeah. Everybody, right? <laughs> I thought that, that, that could have just been having a discussion about could something. Have been anything. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I felt like that was, Jim, you're on mute. I think that was, was Nick Close and the head rigger 
bring in the video wall to trim. I actually have a series because I nerd out in my position on every tour. The thing we do, I am just such a fan of everything we do every day when we get into a building that I literally walk around and take pictures at my job of how cool my colleagues are doing their jobs. I think the whole flying everything in the air and the fact that we do it, we get it up there, it stays up there, does not come down until you guys come in and bring it down methodically and out we go. It, the whole process to me geeks me out every day. Yeah, um, and trim is one of those words. I mean, you don't, as a tour manager specifically, you really don't need to know Pythagoras theorem, but trim is one word you will hear over and over again. And probably the one thing you really need to be aware of is somebody shouting trust coming in or something to that effect, which means there's a large piece of metal coming down towards your head, probably if you're on the stage with your artist and you need to be very much aware of that. So, um, don't make that mistake. That's 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 something to be aware of. <laughs> yeah. If you're sure. up in any any proximity to the stage. So carry on, Gabe. You you were going through your day from there. So so essentially we're getting trusses to trim. Ideally, ideally you want to target in the United States. I feel like you should be targeting at about four hours from the start of your build. You should have most trusses to trim so you can roll the stage into position in under four, five hours. Um, the reason for that is, is typically a labor reason um, because a lot of your stage hands are on five hour minimums um, so that the tour is trying to keep the cost in line. So that's, that's the way you need to structure your, your build times. And for me as a head rigger, that's, that's why I'll interface with my local heads and try to give them a very specific time that we would ideally want to hang the rig in and, and uh, try to make it so we can make that a very consistent thing day to day. Um, after the after the rig is hung, the stage will typically roll into position. Um, if it's a house stage, then it would already be in position. Uh, and then the second part of a head riggers job should be happening, which is is I should I should spend the afternoon um, on the phone talking with the buildings that are out in front of us to make sure that they have a copy of the plot to make sure that they they understand the plot, make sure the staffing is right for those builds. Um, and then then also go over the loadout plan with our, with my local heads. And and Terry actually does something that that nobody else in the country does, which is yeah. she'll she'll, uh, she'll go over what we need to do for loadout oh. and then she'll post a list of all those details outside the the crew room. And so when all of her crew shows up, if it's still during the show or if she doesn't get a chance to talk to them, they can still look through the, let's say the amount of personnel that I wanna have up for the loadout um, or just specific details about that loadout. It's so. really cute. I put a lot of funny pictures and stuff on it for the guys who can't read. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. kind of lightens the loadout, yeah. Right. <laughs> Hey, yeah. Gabe, I wanted to quickly um, take a question from Ken in the chat. And he asks, should vendors be responsible for their own rigging packages or should the TM provide, and that would be tour management, provide a single rigging package for the entire production? So can you talk about whose responsibility it is to come with a rigging package and, and how that gets worked out really quick? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, it depends on the style of gig. Like in, if it's a smaller mm -hmm. tour or, or a one-off, like a single show in a location, I think it's okay that the vendors bring their own rigging packages um, just simply because a lot of times there's not the room in the budget for, for a, a unified rigging package because it may or may not come from the same location as the other items on the tour. So it, it may be a trucking trucking issue um but it for me as a head rigger and i'm sure for these guys as as well we would always prefer a single rigging package just strictly because at the end of the tour it it makes a it makes it a lot easier for us to sort steel number one number two it makes it so especially on the big tours if i have 100 to 130 motors coming in i want to put any motor in any spot 
I want to put one tons where there's one tons, two tons where there's two tons. I don't want to have to spend time added to my day managing the fact that, oh, these are audio two tons, not lighting two tons, or, or another example like that. To where, to where it's just, in my opinion, it's in the on the big stuff. You want to have a one rigging package just for simplicity. Also, it has to do with um, repair on the road. Like if you have multiple motor packages, you also have to carry multiple sets of spares. So multiple sets of spare cable if the cable's not the same. Motor distros, all those things. So to really streamline what you're doing, you should anytime it's big, you should have you should have one motor package. So that really brings it in line with every other production element on a big run. You know, you bring yeah. it on and you carry it so that you have consistency and you have control and you have accountability for the crew. And you're not leaving right. anything to chance. Right. Amazing. You minimize the amount of spares you have to carry, et cetera, et cetera, because it comes down to truck space mm -hmm. also. Yeah. Um, one more question, Gabe. How many riggers would you typically, I, I, I realize I'm asking questions that the answers will vary by their nature, but typically on tour, what's the sort of spread of riggers you might have on the road with an artist? Um, it used to be when I first started that we, we used to carry on big tours, we would carry four touring riggers that were spe specifically just for hanging the motors. Um, the reason for that was that we didn't have in a lot of cities, we didn't have local crews that could handle a real big rigging call. And we needed to be able to pull a bunch of the motors, pull a bunch of the chains up with the touring crew. Um, you know, as we've moved along, I don't see that as much. And I see even on shows that are a lot bigger than those shows were in 2001, 2003. Um, I, see, I see it where there'll be two touring riggers for 120 points, sometimes three. Uh, in my opinion, anywhere over 105 points, 110 points, you should be into a third rigger, uh, specifically for things like box management, um, you know, moving gear in and out, any repairs you have, any motor that doesn't work on the day, then you can dedicate somebody to doing that while you can still manage the install of the rig without without dropping, dropping locations in your management, you know, because for all of us in the touring world, you know, the man management is very location based on the, on the floor as things are happening and as you're, as you're building the thing. Yeah. And it's the, it's the responsibility of the production manager in advance to make sure that the, you know, that, that there are enough riggers on the road for the package you're carrying. So how does, yeah, totally. this is an off the cuff question, but how does that interaction go when you're hired? You know, maybe, maybe you, you're hired and you think, actually this could use one more body. Yeah, it can definitely, <clears throat> I mean, obviously it's an individual tour budget thing as well. And, and I, I'm very fortunate that I usually get what I want, um, but, but it's not, um, it's, it's not all the, it's not standard in the industry. I guess I'll leave it at that. And, and you always have, you always have a bit of a challenge trying to justify things for people. And the way, the way that you do that as a head rigger is to, to really explain how these, that can standardize the day and help standardize the day because what every production manager wants and every show wants is they want it to be the same every day as far as the build time. You really wanna fall into that to where you're not having good days and bad days, even in really tall buildings, any really difficult buildings to rig you're still falling into the same same build times. That goes to Groundhog Day, which we talk about all the time. On tour, we strive for it to be Groundhog Day. Yeah, for sure. And the more the more times you achieve Groundhog Day, the better off you do it. Yeah. yeah. So Gabe, um, you know, I speaking of geeking out, I geek out about that that rig you have going right that pink rig. Um, Gabe is the, the head rigger for Pink's tour, which involves flying the artist to the four corners of the arena while she flips end to end and sideways and also maintains a spot on killer vocal. So let's talk about what you got going on uh, out there. How many, um, how, you know, how does that tour rig work? How many people do you have out there and how does that fly apparatus work? So on that tour, I carry 
you know, I carry more rigors than most people do, uh, partly because I dedicate two rigors specifically into installing that flag egg. Um, what, what that flag egg is, is it's very similar to what spider cam is, where you have a camera flying around a space. In this case, we have an artist flying around the space. Um, the way we do it, which is different than spider cam, is we will we will put two winches on the ground on either side of the stage, and then we will divert shivs. We'll put shivs up in the ceiling that the lines from the winches go up to, and then the lines will will follow into the four corners of the room, and and divert into the four corners of the room, then come down and so join. You're, you're literally putting you're putting towers up around. Uh, no, not necessarily. We're most of the time we can we can just run shivs that are hard pointed to the beam. What's a shiv? A shiv what is what Terry has a little picture of right there. Except they're ah. they're uh, bigger. Okay. So I it's a wheel it. that the it's a wheel that the winch line goes through that allows you to change the direction of the line. So we will put usually on that fly gag we'll put twenty or twenty five of them up in the air that to get the lines into place. And then uh, and then once the lines uh, get to the four corners of the room, we bring them down and join them together. And you have a four-way bridle that you can move into any section of the room. That is so wild to me. Yeah. So it's so wild. I, I really, again, there goes Adrian geeking out about this business. That shit to me is golden. That's like, yeah. ab, you know, we think our riggers are in touring for those who don't know, we, we think our riggers are the rock stars of our tours because if shit does not get in the air and stay in the air, it doesn't, we don't have a show. Things can't just be sitting on the deck. You know, they got to get lifted in a timely manner and everything else goes on after that happens. And the same with how it comes down. So these are the people that are responsible for the health and safety of pretty much our entire yeah. show. And we don't want to discuss what happens when a rig doesn't stay in the air. You know, we did discuss it. We had Pete Yozel from Radiohead on and we talk about what happens when a rig comes down. So we look at these people on this broadcast today as the people that make or break our day. And we really, the riggers, never mind a fly gag or any pressure that you have with the safety of an artist who's going end over end in the air. Yeah, I mean, that was definitely that's definitely one of the biggest challenges with with uh, Pink and that particular flag gag is is we we want to maintain the audience interaction, which keeps her at about a lot of times anywhere from twelve feet above the ground to sixty feet above the ground, depending on what she does. But we also needed the ability to to be able to lower her down to the ground safely if we ever lost power to the winches or, or had a fault in the computer programming, which is why we ended up doing the winches all at the stage corners and, and down on the ground. So we can, if we were at, to ever lose power, we can manually lower her to the ground from any point in the arena. And we just need to take time to, to uh, get security into place to get her back to the stage. Right. Amazing. That's really something. And you have obviously been up in the rig. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. Who tests it? How do you got, you got to test it daily. I'm um, sure. We, we test it every day. Yeah. We test it every day and we have a rotation of people that will do that. Um, <laughs> there's, there's times that I don't, I don't have time in my day to be able to do it, but I, I do it any chance I get because it's your that's, own personal roller coaster. That's and so she, crazy. She's very lucky. Um, when we were doing the stadium runs last year, she's flying at about 40 feet per second, which is which is unbelievable. And that's custom winches out of tape that that uh, she's the only one on the planet that's ever done anything like that in a live show. While, at that speed. while, while vocalizing. Yeah, yeah while for vocalizing. sure. For sure. And, and I definitely, like, I didn't believe that that was true when I first started working for her. I, I thought for sure that she was running track or faking it, but we were doing an iHeart radio show and, and uh, I had, I had just run in the apparatus and was pretty sure that she was definitely not singing. And then she came in and got in the apparatus and there was no microphones on or anything. There was hardly anybody in the room. And she started singing the song as she was flying to try to, try to work with her body to be able to push the notes out as she's flying around. So. 
really something. Yeah, good really woman. Something. Yeah, she's really, she really is something. Um, and kudos to all of you guys who come in and do that technology that makes show business so show businessy, you know, hmm. so different, so cool. All right, over to uh, Jim to chat with everybody about mentors. Yeah, as we know, mentors are extremely important in rigging. Um, can you each tell us uh, who your mentors were and how they helped you in your careers? Terry, let's start with you. Who is your mentor? Well, you've all heard a lot about Howard, Howard the great Howard Campbell. And uh, I mean, I just owe him 100%. He's, I won't say he's been patient, but he's been persistent with me. Um, and I still, I never stopped learning with him. I mean, we, um, we actually got a 400 pound stove upstairs at our house here and we had to get it through a narrow staircase. And so we rigged it. We borrowed a couple of, of uh, half ton chain crawling motors and he made a couple of pick points in the ceiling upstairs. And I was, I was running you know, the, the, the electricity that took it all up and it was pretty frightening. So I just have to say, Howard has just been awesome. Um, I worked at the Cow Palace with the stage rigging crew, um, and and that's you know pretty much where I was in my infancy. Uh, and I just learned from the very beginning just to keep your eyes open and your mouth shut, and work hard. And that's you know I've been I've been very blessed. Nice, Letty. Tell us about your mentors. Yeah. Um, again, I'll say it. Uh, we're fortunate to have the stage rigging crew here in the Bay Area. And, you know, when I was younger and just starting out, I had a friend that I dragged into it. Uh, he was uh, he, he was studying structural engineering, get, getting his master's at Sac State. And he just, he, he'd come along with me for fun. He rigged for fun. I did it for a living because he's building bridges now. Um, but he, he was the one who was helping me uh, uh, on, on the math and and on the understanding structures, but you know, on the rock and roll level, I was really intrigued by stuff that uh, Brent Anderson did, and uh, you know, he he was the one who took me out on my first first tour, and along with that, it's like along with stage rigging crew, you have uh, Rocky Paulson, who's like really like the godfather of rigging in in the area in, in the U.S. and guys I reach out to you quite a bit. Or like um, Joe Clayton, you know, he was young when I was young, but he was up there climbing at the Cow Palace, and he's a big guy too. But uh, uh, he's a really knowledgeable dude. And one of the first guys told me that, you know, he calls his bridles before going into buildings, <clears throat> and he, he's really smart at drawings and stuff. Marty Cohen is another one. He's a he's one I call one eight hundred Marty Maha, and it, yeah, it's just. Uh, you take those guys that uh, were, were in it early on and, st and still were at it. And uh, whenever I have questions to this day, I still call them up and, and ask them, you know, clues and how they feel about certain things. Okay. So Gabe, who were your mentors? Um, I would say my, my mentors were a touring rigger named Mark Ward, who, who uh, these guys know for sure. Uh, Bobby and Bobby uh, Savage and John Fletcher, who founded Five Points Rigging out of Nashville. Um, Chuck Melton, who still is touring, probably he's touring with Celine Dion right now. And then um, also Ken Mitchell's another one that I didn't think of. Uh, Ken Mitchell's a great rigger and has been for quite some time. So all, all uh, touring riggers for sure. Amazing. <clears throat> That's so important. Um, so over to Letty and Terry on this one. Some of the younger people out there that uh, think that women being riggers or doing anything on the technical side um, is a new thing. But as we're illustrating today, having women on the technical side um, has been a thing for years and years and years. Did you, either of you, have a challenge? I mean, you know, obviously, Terry, we know that Howard kind of dragged you kicking and screaming and you made the decision. But once you got into the position, did you run up into anything um, challenging being a tiny little five foot two thing? 
Almost never. Like when we were uh, first out on tour, um, I think it might've been Cleveland or someplace. Uh, I, I got, I hit up with some, I got hit up with some chauvinism there where, you know, guys were like, what the hell is she doing here? Um, but remarkably, and considering it was, you know, 40, 42 years ago, um, everyone has always treated me as, I like to say as an equal, but I guess one of my mottos is with, with any of my people, men or women, I say, um, choose balance, not equality. And that just means to me that you bring to the table what, what you have and ac accentuate your gifts, work on the things you need to work on. Um, and I really have been treated with nothing but respect and gratitude from everybody. That's really fantastic. And we, we, we love that. Um, Especially um, Gabe. We, <laughs> <laughs> we love, we love balance. Um, and we talk balance, about, not equality. Yeah. I love that. Um, Letty, what do you think? How's it been for you out there being on the road as the head rigger too? Um, yeah, th there's been challenges. Um, early on, it's like, we'll start with the physical challenges of going from a 50 foot arena to an 85, 95 foot arena where uh, I remember Marty Cohen was up pulling points on a show that he came through with. And I noticed his, his back was straight. It was like all arm and, and lats and he wasn't really, you know, exerting a lot. And I realized it's time to hit the gym again. And so we really got to get in the gym and get in good physical shape. And then, you know, I've always been a competitive person because I was an athlete in high school. And so this was now my sport. So uh, at Big Arco, it was like, you know, we th those were our points. I want that one. I want that one. I want that one. That one's mine. And which is something that you don't have anymore. There, there's guys that don't have that, uh, you know, that drive. <clears throat> and you're not, you can't, you can't learn anybody that skill. It's like, it's all heart. You know, you got to be born with it. And, you know, I say if, if you have the strength to go do it and take care of yourself, uh, do it. But on the other level, when I was touring, <clears throat> hitting certain parts of the country, um, it was different because, uh, yeah, guys were a little bit harder on the, on the young on the young female out there, but it, I felt that the more and more they'd see me, uh, the more lax they got, like the last few tours I did in that area, uh, they were like more than welcoming. It's like, it was just like totally night and day, you know, they wanted to see what I was up to, you know, cause I, you know, I'd been around for nearly 20 years at that point, but, um, on the local level, yeah, there was challenges and that's why, um, uh, that's why it took me a little bit longer to get into uh, my second local in the 107 because uh, there was there was there was some old blood there that didn't really want the young female that already had another union card to come in, and uh, I had to really uh, uh, just get through it, put my head down, persevere, do my job. But there was a lot of uh, as as much there there were guys that didn't really weren't acceptant of. Uh, a female rigger coming in there were a lot of guys that were and they liked being my partner you know when we were up pulling points and and now it's like we have a couple females in our local that i'm, I'm happy to have they're, they're doing good and some of them rig circles around some of the newer guys that come in that just want to be cool with a rope over their shoulder and i i invite any female that wants to come up and actually do the job but you got to do it you got to be there for the right reasons and you're you got to have your head in the game. Indeed. Indeed. Um, um, can I just ask really quick as an extension of that? Cause I'm, I'm curious, like you, you, you mentioned getting in the gym. What, how, how in shape do you need to be, to be a rigger? How, how <laughs> physical is the job? Well, you think about how high, how tall your arena is and, and you know, you figure you're pulling up about 80 pounds, 85 pounds, just do those reps, those low rows. You know, do like 20 sets, 85 pounds or pull downs or, you know, you're thinking about pulling out a motor out of a box, you know, it's another 80 pounds. <clears throat> you're just uh, j just do a lot of low rows and count your sets. Do your I was leg. a runner. So that my leg saved me. I did a lot of I was able to 
But yeah, you can't be in good enough shape because it's dangerous and you'll be up there and you'll go, shit, you know, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this, but you have to do it. I mean, well, you do. Terry, you were up there in the beams pregnant. Talk about it. Well, um, <clears throat> yeah, I didn't mean to do that, but it was a happy accident. But we were just getting ready to go on a road. We we're hoping to go on a, a international tour together. Um, and then I found myself pregnant. So I, I kept rigging at the Cow Palace and uh, I kept it quiet because I didn't want to be discriminated against. But it got to the point where, I mean, I'm like 105 feet up in the the beams and there's places you have to get into where there's these little triangle trusses and you've got to scooch in there. And I had to the point where I couldn't fit anymore. So, so then I ended up um, ground rigging and I stayed as a ground rigger. And again, that's, you know, you're, you're lifting 100 foot, these, these chain crawling motors weigh about a hundred pounds and we'll lift, you know, a hundred of them out of a box every day. So I had to still be lifting things on the ground and scampering everywhere. So um, I was able to do that. And then um, the first child was seven months early. So uh, my husband had to come home and all that, but, but then the second, so two I immediately months, got pregnant. Two months early. Two months, two two months, months early, early, sorry. Okay. Seven months, four and seven months, two months early. But then I immediately found that I had another kid coming um, and kind of the same thing, except I was rigging at Shoreline Amphitheater, which is much lower a more appropriate place, I would think for, you know, you kind of have to pick your places. So that was a, you know, so that was more doable for me, but I hid that till I was like four months along. And then guys started wondering why I kept having to pee all the time and cracker crumbs in my bag. And so, yeah, you, you can do it. You just got to stay in really good shape, make sure your doctor knows what you're doing and just, um, you know, use your, your best judgment. Yeah. What's your, what's your advice really quickly for women who are thinking about having children or being a mom and, and being in these technical positions? And um, I would, I, I, I think once, you know, you, your child is here, it'd be just like any other profession. Um, I was having to ride my bike home from work, which obviously is close by, but like every five hours to like pump milk and stuff. So that got kind of crazy, but um, I, I guess I would, if I were just kind of really talking kind of privately with a woman, I would just say really, you know, use your best discretion. And when you are maybe four or five months along, um, I would try to curtail a lot of the really heavy pulling personally. Thank you so much for all that insight. Over to you, Jim. Um, let's talk about the high points of your working history. Uh, Terry, why don't you tell us about some of the high points? Um, well, I guess the one for me that everybody's pretty sick of hearing about, if you know me at all, is that um, my husband and I were working the hockey game about 15, or I guess almost 20 years ago. And uh, he's running the big shark head that comes down and the hockey guys come out. I was just running to follow spot. But our hockey mascot, who's this you know, he's about 260 pounds or so. Um, and he does this gag all by himself. He rappels down from our ceiling at almost 100 feet in this big shark outfit. And his head's about three feet, you know, long. So I've got my spot on him and he's rappelling down and he gets about halfway down and he his uh, rappelling device gets jammed up. He gets his hockey jersey in there. So he's hanging at like 50 feet totally stuck in this big outfit in front of it. it was like family night. So there's like, you know, 18,000 people and their little kids. So um, again, my husband and I had nothing to do with this gag. We didn't rig it. We, you know, we're just like, this isn't our thing, but you know, you got to save the guy. So my husband ran out to our car to get a rope and I went over to the location. Um, and then the engineers actually brought me a rope before we got our own rope. So I ended up rescuing him and um, I had to climb out on a little eight inch beam, you know, at hundred feet with no harness. And I, you can see it in video, you can see it on the Sharky gets rescued video, but, but I'm on this little beam with no harness and I'm holding onto the railing with one hand and I have to take a hold of his rope. I had, I had some engineers and guys in suits helping me pull him up, but I took like a wrap on a beam and let it all in. 
I didn't want to cut his rigging that he put in because it was like, I didn't rig it. I was like, I do not want to touch this. And I thought the redundancy could be important. So I ended up having to climb out of this beam and breast this big guy out far enough where we could get him and his head and his outfit onto the catwalk. And so 20 years later, they're still showing that in bloopers. And so a lot of the new riggers that I get on my cruise, um, you know, who look at old me and stuff and go, oh, she, you know, she didn't. I did. <laughs> I did. I was up there, you know, once upon a time. And that is on YouTube, right? That video is on YouTube. It's on YouTube. It it's, yeah, <laughs> Sharky Gets Stuck. The Daily Show came out and we did a parody. And then there was just on a, um, there's a hockey blog and I forget what it's called, but it's, there's a, a blog where the guy interviewed all just a couple months ago. And I was kind of able to tell my side of the story of what Rocky Paulson called it a mayhem rescue. So it's not as unsafe as you might think. And I had, I made the choices I made and I would do them again. Um, but I'd also coincidentally a couple months before I'd fallen off a boat and grabbed myself by my arm and like took a pretty good you know, jerk. So I just kept saying in my head, you know, you can hold on, you know, you can hold yourself up with this railing and you just do not go anywhere with this one hand. So I knew that we were going to get that guy. The fire department couldn't get him. So that was, that was probably the thing everybody's pretty darn sick of hearing about, but the new guys all like it. Letty, tell us some, some of your um, greatest experiences. Me, myself, I, I just have to think back at how many times I say to myself, I got the greatest job in the world, you know, and right now I can't think of any one particular, but I say it a lot to myself when I'm working, you know, as there's just a, a lot of shows. And I think one of the best moments for me personally was when um, I think the business agent in uh, Oakland asked me to come and help them out in Oakland, help them rig in Oakland. That was a big thing for me at that age. And then I guess when um, when I got the phone call and, and was asked to go out and do the Michael Jackson tour, which was unexpected, but really exciting. And it was uh, one of the greatest experiences ever. Um, so, you know, that in a nutshell, there are so many, there's just so many moments that I just, uh, sorry, I can't just pick one right now. <laughs> Gabe, tell us about some of your moments. Yeah, I would say for me, um, it's like Letty said. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of different people you see and different artists you work with, and shows you you really remember for different reasons. Uh, for me personally, some of the some of the greatest artists that I've worked with are working with Justin as a solo artist. Uh, Justin is absolutely fantastic, a fantastic guy. Um, and uh, just an amazing performer. He's one of the only artists that I've ever worked with that when they showed up to production rehearsals, he and the whole cast knew the entire show cold. Like they didn't have to, they didn't need any rehearsals when they showed up to the first production rehearsal because they were that dialed. Um, and then I would say, obviously working with, with Alicia with Pink, she's, she's just on another level from any other female artist currently. Um, and, and what she does with her body is, is just unbelievable. And, and it's, it's also very challenging for all of us on the touring crew, because we spend a lot of time with her in the aerials, just, just trying to get it so it works for her to be able to push out the notes and for her to be able to sing. Um, so those are, those are two of the good ones. And then, then uh, I, I got to, uh, rig for the uh, for the Metallica movie which was totally a flop as far as a show but but uh, the live concert was incredible and and uh, if we had you know 200,000 pounds up in the air 70,000 pounds moving over the stage and a stage that could do 20 foot high flames every five feet so it was seeing seeing Metallica live is something I, I feel like every every music fan should see because it is something else compared to anything you'll ever hear outside of their shows. So, yeah, those are those are some ones for me. If you if you just take a step back as a concert goer, as a touring crew member who's working on the road, 
and realize what's actually going on, it's incredible. Drum sets are not meant to spin in the air while Slipknot or Motley Crue are playing them. You know, the gags that Pink or Kiss or any number of these amazing groundbreaking artists pull off, they're not, they're, they are, they are incredible in and of themselves, let alone while performing. So, you know, it's, if you actually take a second to stop and think about what's going on on that stage, it's, it's mind blowing. And even more so when it gets up and down within the day and then goes on to the next city and the next city and the next city. So, um, I, I, yeah, this has been really, really amazing and educational for me, especially. Um, we're, um, we're definitely going to take a few questions. Yeah. Let's go into questions. Um, let's let's go to Letty with Tammy Martin's question. Letty, how has Riggin changed over the years, do you think? Well, the shows have gotten bigger. Like, you know, normal size shows, like I think the Grateful Dead was big at 40 points and, and then it grew to 60 and then possibly 80. And then then shows just, just blown up to 100 and, you know, it's 150 points sometimes. Um, PUBG was really big. I think I think we were up to like 170,000 pounds on that one. Yeah. So you're talking even from going 40,000 to like uh, 170,000, the show has just gotten really, really huge. So I think that's one of the biggest things and a lot more special effects. Everybody's got to bring in some gags. And, and that's what amazes me, um, you know, some, a two person performance like 21 pilots has to have every gag in the world. <laughs> yeah, I was like one of the biggest shows. And uh, you know, that, that's, where it's, uh, that's where it's changed. It's just all the gags. Fair enough, that's great. Um, we have, Gabe, I'd love to shoot this question to you um, regarding the difference between international touring is rigging the same internationally, or are there any major differences country to country, Gabe? You're muted, buddy. There Sorry you go. about that. Um, yeah, totally. There's there's quite a few differences depending on where you are in the world. Um, some of it has to do with the, the quality of local crew that you can get. Um, some of it has to do with the timing of the day. Um, Specifically in Europe, uh, most of your local crew is on, on uh, salary or day rates. So there's not quite as much pressure to hit those times as there are that the, as there is in the United States. Also, um, a lot of the European buildings require a rigging overlay well before you get to the venue where that's still, that's still not, I would say not standard in all the buildings in the United States. Um, and they, they will always send things to the engineers. So those are some of the things. And then it just totally depends on what part of the, what part of the Europe you're talking about or what part of the world you're talking about. But yeah, there's a lot of differences. What about gear? Is there a diff big difference in gear that you use? Um, like the crawling chain motors, et cetera. Are they the same internationally or, is, or are the differences? Yeah, I mean, the way that I try to, try to staff, try to provide the gear for the tours that I do is, is motors that will work anywhere in the world. But there are requirements, especially like through Germany and uh, Italy for motors to be double brake nowadays, which means that there's two individual brakes that can each hold the load that the motor is rated for. Very cool. So, yeah, Great. so most, of, yeah, to answer your question, yes, there there's more requirements going through Europe. Okay, and as an extension of that question, one thing we, we, we didn't talk about was safety certificates. Terry, maybe you can answer this one for us. What, what does a rigger need in terms of certification, um, at least in the US? Um, yeah, that might not be the greatest question for me, but just personally at our building, um, to be on the rigging crew, they're really, we don't have any specific requirements like that per se. Um, both Letty and I have taken, taken an international um, rigging exam and we're like two, I, 
I, I think I'm number five. She's probably like number two or something like that in California to become certified. Uh, so for our building requirements, I guess, uh, they, they wanted me to get my certification and it was a good thing. Um, but to be a local on our crew, there's no specific as, specifics as yet, but I do encourage the newcomers and stuff to study for this exam. It's very, it's very helpful. Okay, so those are not mandatory across the board? Not us. personally. The other two um, might have more to say about that. Gabe, how about you in terms of being on the road? Do you, is there anything you're required? No, there's, there's not anything that's necessarily required in the United States. Um, I've taken a lot of the OSHA, OSHA classes and all the safety classes to, for you know, OSHA 30s and those type of things as well, <coughs> excuse me, as well as uh, safety classes for essentially any kind of machine that we might end up running. Uh, as well as uh, Sprat and IRATA stuff, which is rope access stuff. Um, but in the United States and in the touring world, there's no standardized um, certificate that I'm aware of. In some of the European countries, that, that's different. If I, if I remember right, in the UK, there has to be a, a rigging certificate for your local riggers. Um, and then a few of the other countries, which, you know, again, they're, they're the rules for them are a little bit different and they're hired more on a, more on a different, in a different way. Um, but yeah, there's, there's not really anything standardized for the touring world. It, it would be, would definitely be welcome, um, you know, pending that it, pending that it also goes into a lot of the practical knowledge and the things that, that make people good riggers that aren't necessarily just black and white on paper. Right. Okay, great. Um, hey, got a, we got a question from Ken. Yeah. Can you save money on a package by swapping one tons for half tons where, where you can, or is, it, is the cost the same? Is it, or is it easier just to have all one tons? That's for you, Gabe. Um, you, should really, you should really design your rigging package based on the loads that you're gonna encounter. Um, depending on the vendor that you're getting the motors from, you might be able to save $5 a motor per week by going to the half tons. Um, for, for me personally, the way I, I will design my touring rigs is I will actually like over motor them a little bit, which what that means is, is let's, see, let's say a truss could hang on two motors and, and be heavily loaded. I would put a third motor on it. And that's specifically, so if, if one of my touring guys is running the motors on two hours of sleep and forgets to select a motor and, and starts to run the truss down, the truss won't, won't fail. So essentially in my mind, it's more, it's more important to design your rig. So you have plenty of capacity in your motors um, for what you're lifting. Awesome. Okay. I I think we're good. I think we're good on questions. Letty, Mark, Letty, I just got a message from Mike Morbido. He sends his love to you. Oh. <laughs> Patty says, I feel like I've learned a new language today. I'm with you, Patty. This, is, this has been really illuminating. Um, you can go years in touring through clubs and theaters without really encountering this, particularly if you're just a tour manager, you don't cover production, you know, you can go years into your career without really encountering a lot of this. And it's really useful to have it broken down because it does, it does seem daunting from the outside, but it's such a huge important part of the show. Um, and when safety and security of the crew and the audience, the artists, everyone in the room is concerned, it is really um, crucially important that you support your rigors. So, Terry, Letty, Gabe, thank you so much for being with us today. This was this was really one of our favorite episodes. My one of my favorite episodes. I learned a lot today. So thank you for guys sure. for being with us. For sure. <laughs> thank you. For thank you guys us. very thank much. You. Um, we so, hope to see everyone out there soon. Yes. Sooner than later. Yeah. Um, we're gonna um, be. This is our last episode of the spring semester. We'll be keeping you guys updated via our socials about what we've got coming up. Uh, tour 
MGMT101 on all of the socials and on YouTube. You can subscribe to us, check out all of the other 70 to 80 other episodes that we have, however many it is. I don't know. Um, <laughs> 78. Um, <laughs> and uh, thanks for all our guests for joining us again. Um, keep in touch, you guys, and we will be back when we're back and we'll let you guys know. Everybody be safe. Have a great week. Thank, Thank you, you for having Thank you, guys. Thank you. Wave it out. Zoom wave. Ha, ha, ha.